Hello everyone, it's Lennon. Welcome to the channel. Today I'm looking like the love witch because I want to talk about magic. Okay? I want to talk about the price of magic. Okay? This is a question that has been kind of, you know, haunting me. Not not a real haunting, more of a like a there's an there's an inkling that something's there, but it's like a poltergeist. It's moving shit around in my mind, okay? But I can't always interact and see him, you know? <laughs> Sorry. And I've taken some notes because, um, like, I've just been sitting here. And it's, like, to be winter, okay, in Georgia, it's not. So it's, like, thunderstorming outside. And it's, like, I think it's, like, 50 degrees. So it's like chilly and rainy. So I decided to get my wizard robes and uh, my love witch glamour magic on for this because I wanted to take you through the notes and like my thought processes with this. Because to me, I always thought, and it's always good to like, for me, okay, okay, let me say this. It's always good for me to recheck my beliefs around something or recheck, not get, okay, I don't wanna get so severe with my beliefs and my thought processes. I want to be able to kind of shift them as I grow as a person psychologically, duh, 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 okay? I want to be able to say that I'm adaptable and I don't want to be too rigid. So sometimes I go back to the, like, I have to go back to the basics, right? Of my witchcraft or my belief structure and say, do I really believe this? Or do I still believe this? Or uh, has it just, a little bit you know moved a little bit <clears throat> and for me magic that the concept of magic never had a price okay like you see in, in in movies and things like that like if you do this you know it could take an arm or it can take a hand or a foot or a piece of your soul like in, in a lot of the myths, stories, fairy tales, magic seems to have a price. And it depends on the magical working. Like, the bigger the magic, uh, the harder the price. But it depends also what you bring to the magic. Like, say you're doing a spell, right? And this is like, in an actual, this is an actual example. Don't know what it is. Uh, can't think of the actual name. I'll probably leave it in the description box, though, if I remember. But this was like a show, right? And if you say you're doing like this alchemical spell, full metal alchemist, there you go. You're doing this spell, right? And you bring a chicken head and this and this and this. You're bringing things to the spell, right? Then the price is like lesser, right? It kind of zhuzhes down on the price that you would have to pay in the end. It's kind of, but then that also made me think of selling your soul to the devil. You know, it's just like the same kind of thing. Are you making packs? with magic. And what magic is it? Is it the magic of your deities, the magic of spirit, genus loci, um, like land spirits and things like that? Is this like ancestors? Like we're taking something? No, no, we can't be taking something from them. Um, is this earth? Are we, are we, when we take from the earth and not give back, like if there's not a reciprocity there, then do we have to pay a price? for that, you know? So, hmm. up until this point, I felt like magic doesn't really have a price per se because it's always there. And there's like a select few of us that can even see, perceive, and tap into this kind of energy, right? Magic being this kind of energy on the web of nature, okay? The web of life that few can tap into anyway. So it's like, we're not siphoning all this you know, magic and leaving nothing. You know, like if, if I did a spell, I'm not leaving the earth with nothing. Okay. It's almost like there's, I could never do enough spells to drain the earth's energy. Let's just say, or, or the, the magic that I'm getting through evocation or invocation or the magic that I'm getting through whatever. Okay. <laughs> But then it got me thinking that, you know, when I do certain magical workings, I feel my own energy getting siphoned as well. Like, of course, because when you use your own energy, you can drain that too. And so 
I think that's why we work with external energies so that we're not draining our own all the time. Okay. But I think it's, it's important to kind of know the balance of like, okay, this is, I'm putting this in, this is my stuff. This is your stuff. This is the earth stuff. This is the thunderstorm stuff, you know, <laughs> like is, is there a delicate balance? But in order to find the balance, what mo what must we, what must we do? Right. And I think of the movie, the love witch, you know, she does magic to get what she wants. Okay. And I don't want to say that she doesn't care about the consequences. Okay. I just think that that movie is a good lesson for us that in order to avoid paying the price, maybe we should like do some pre-work, pre-planning and say magic and just as a mission statement, magic shouldn't be used for everything. You know, like, and then about gratitude as well. Okay. Because, you know, when you live a good life and you still feel like you don't have a good life, that's where you kind of tap into that. I got to do this to get this and this and this. And it goes into the seven deadly sin things that I do with my magic, which is like envy and lust, you know, power and pride and all that. It's like when you are constantly vying for those things, then that's where you want to go to magic for. It's what you want to go to magic for. And that's, I think that magic coming with a price goes in those realms that you know, if you're using magic for everything and not doing anything with your own essence, I guess, then the price that you would pay would be greater. I don't know. I don't know what the glass of water looks like that I'm trying to like use as a metaphor here. I don't know what that looks like. But then I think that there are some witches that, especially the ones I've seen on like YouTube and on uh, blogs and stuff, they talk about magic having a price, like say I go outside and I want to siphon some storm energy, okay? Because as a weather witch, I go out, I like thunderstorms, I go out, I get, try to get some of that energy like through storm water or just through when I rain bathe, I be out, I'm like out in the rain and I, I kind of feel that, that energy of the storm going into me as the water drips onto my skin, right? So that's kind of like the, the end of that magic going into me, right? energetically speaking. But if I just go inside and do my magical working or, you know, hold off on that energy until I need to uh, enchant something, then did I not pay enough? Did I not pay a price? Must I like give something back? You know, like the, the whole witch in the woods thing, you got to get tobacco, a secret, alcohol your first one <laughs> you know like do I do I have I've heard this said before like if I take something I must give back but then what do you how do you know what to give back and if it's enough I kind of touched on this in in an offering video that I did a little while ago I'll leave it upstairs for you it was about offering to spirits and deities gods and goddesses or whatever, and how I kind of use the four element system, earth, air, fire, and water, to know in which realm to give the offering. Because otherwise, if I didn't have a system, I wouldn't know what the hell to give. Or if it was, if I'm trying to, like say I'm trying to evoke a, a spirit and I give an offering as a way to, as a devotional way to say, please and thank you, okay? What if that offering's not good enough? Or is any offering good enough? It's just the act of you offering. It's just an energetic exchange, you know? But I needed a structure because it just didn't feel, I guess, like magical enough. So you can go check that video out. Um, but that's the same concept. If I sprinkle, a, like if I just shove a cigarette outside, is that enough of an offering for me siphoning up a 30 minute thunderstorm, <laughs> right? Is that enough of a price that I pay? Or does it come from in here? Is it not an external thing, like a man-made thing that I'm giving out? 
but I have to give something of mine. Hair, blood, sweat, whatever, right? What do I do? What do you guys do? This is kind of why I wanted to pose a community post about this so that we can kind of discuss this because I don't want to be the only one discussing this. But I guess you have to see what this whole thing has made me realize um, or what this whole thing has made me do in my brain is think about what I believe magic actually is. And I guess I would say it's an energy. It's an energy that is present, can be perceived, can be tapped into, and it lies, it's the liminality in causality, which is my statement for what magic is. I came up with that a while ago. Uh, liminality in causality, which means it lies on the web of nature, the web of life, in between cause and effect. So that's what magic is to me. But then, what is my responsibility as a witch to magic? Because I kind of feel, like I, like I said in my um, vlog, my winter vlog, that I was kind of like wrapping up 2023, I kind of talked about my death wizard, okay, and how I've been in this wizard mode for a while now. And I keep thinking that in wizardry, <clears throat> like through myths and stories and shit, wizards have this like, like there's an order to them, right? Like the order of Merlin, okay? And... They have a responsibility because they are magic perceivers and magic wielders. Think of uh, Radagast the Brown from Lord of the Rings. He feels a responsibility to the forest because he himself is a forest magic dweller and perceiver of the magic there. He can see it and he can tap into the magic of the forest. So he feels kind of a responsibility to take care of the forest. Um, and it's like the price of his magic is that he's turned himself or he's turned into, uh, or he's um, adapted the role of forest healer and forest dweller. But it's also a passion of his. This is a passion of his, like Gandalf said, that he he loves to be with animals in the forest more than he wants to be in the human world. So uh, it's not so much that he's paying the price and he's miserable, you know? He's tapping into his gifts. He's tapping into uh, what his passions are. So is that what we have to do? We have to follow our bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say. And that would be in a way of living our truth And by living our truth, living our gifts, living our, uh, following our bliss, is that us turning uh, ourselves as magic wielders and taking responsibility for our lives is taking responsibility and doing what we love enough to be able to continue to use, see and use magic. Is this a lot of thoughts? Someone help me. Okay, what else did I put in my notes? Okay, now I like to watch Angela Symposium, okay? And I think that she taps into where magic comes from in terms of like, like etymologically, okay? Back to Roman times, it, it derives from this word, this word, this word, this word, okay? Um, which doesn't actually tell you what those people back in those times, okay, probably what, the Bronze Age? Probably the Bronze Age. But anyway, going back to the Bronze Age, and let's say magic started there, etymologically, like the word magic, right? It doesn't say... <laughs> When you when you when you look it up like she does, like researching like she does, it says, "Oh yeah, well, they came up with this word means this." It doesn't actually tell you what they thought magic was. It just says what the word means. 
And that's through word of mouth, not probably written down anywhere. So it's theory at this point, you know, <laughs> like we're theorizing what magic even was back then. And that's not even that long ago. So to me, I'm like, okay, I, I used to think, and like I said, see, this is all about shifting beliefs, okay? I used to think that magic from ancient times, okay, the magic that they would have practiced or that they would have seen was anything that they didn't know scientifically, okay? Like whether or not uh, the universe is helios or our, 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 no, whether or not our solar system is heliocentric. Again, that's a relatively new establishment. So before that, anything that would happen in the cosmos, like in the sky, you know, the stars can be mapped. Uh, comets look like bombs coming right at you, okay? Uh, anger, the go anger, yeah, anger of the gods, right? Um, harsh, harsh agricultural events, right? Like crops not coming to fruition the way that they planned, stuff like that. It was probably, I always theorized that magic was what we don't know scientifically, what we can't explain. But I can explain a thunderstorm. I can still tap into that magic. And, and then, okay, huh, I'm talking, uh, cause I'm rambling here. Okay. I'm, I'm probably going to hit to a point. I don't know if I will. I'm talking here in this video, like up to this point about earth magic, like storms do okay that i think that's there's potent magic in morning dew for real okay um that time of twilight which is my favorite time it's like a a, a light inky watercolory purple sky right and it's heavy with summer perfume like this heat radiation that's trying to dissipate with the night, with the darkness. And it's that liminal, the fireflies are out, and it's that liminal time that's just going like this. And you wanna, you can, I feel that. I feel that this, there's this pull to me to go outside and tap into that magic, right? So I know that earth magic exists, but are there other kinds of magic? Okay. Now I will say that I consider earth magic to be earth on this sphere. Okay. On this earthly, in this earthly sphere, a part, a part of cosmological magic being one sphere in a solar system. Okay. So there must be magic in the solar system. It can't just be earth. I'm like, how fucking vain is that, right? So the solar system has magic. How do I tap into that? Like I said, I try to use um, void and chaos energy. I try to use planetary energy, uh, comet, uh, meteor shower energy, um, moon energy, okay? What? <clears throat> and then anything else, black hole, uh, uh, stars that we actually know, Vega, Sirius, like, well, that's a constellation. <laughs> you get my drift, like stars outside of our solar system. Um, can we tap into that? So that's cosmological total magic. But then what about other dimensions? Can you tap into astral magic? You can go to the astral all you want to. You can take journeys. You can go on shamanic journeys. You can path walk. You can hedge ride. Okay? You can go to the Sabbath. Can you bring magic back? Can you... Does magic go into you? Seep into you when you go to those other realms? Can you use that magic? For a magical working that you would do on your plane. 
question mark. <laughs> I think I've come to the realization that the price that we pay, or that I'll say I, the price that I would pay for my magic, or that I believe that I do, lies in my emotions. There's there's a transmutation that happens emotionally with humans, I believe. So if I have heightened emotions, extremely moody, extremely emotional crying, extremely rageful, extremely joyous emotions can be transmuted I believe that when we are hit with certain heightened emotions okay and I mean really high high emotions high emotional states that is our price th those are the prices that we pay for magic and it's kind of like in those moments when you're really heightened, that's when you want to go to your magic. Why is that? Because that's that energy in you. That's the cup overfilleth. And you you look at it, you look at your you're looking at your cup, okay, and it's overfilling with emotion. And you want a way to get rid of the water that you don't want to throw it away. You want to use it. You want to use those extra drops that are making it overfill. So you want to go to your magic and you want to put that extra zhuzh into something. It's innate. Isn't it? Should we transmute our emotions into our magic? Or do we do it without even realizing it? I guess to recap, okay, because I don't know if I came to a point, is my ultimate question for you guys, okay, let's talk about this in the comments, is does magic have a price? <clears throat> and if it does, what is the state of that price? Does it depend on the magical working? Does it depend on what you have available to give the magical working? at the start of it, right? Do you have a responsibility as a magic wielder, as a magical practitioner, to give back? And how do you give back? If it is, if yes, okay, this is like one of those things where it's like, yes, no, go this way, go this way, and then it leads to down here, okay? Uh, and I don't know what is down here. Um, <clears throat> and then if yes, What do you give it? Do you give it through emotions, through offerings? And if, and let's say that you're a magical, pra tech, pra blah, magical practitioner that does not have a deity or spirit practice. You give offerings to the earth. I don't know how that would work. Um, but let me know, okay? Because we're all different. All of our magic is different and it's beautiful, okay? Uh, let's see. Have you paid a price before? How, how have you paid a price before that you can recall? And you're like, wow, I think that that was because of my magic. And it doesn't always have to be like a bad thing. Like you lost a finger or some shit. Um, it can just be like a time where you were like, eh, yeah, I paid the price for that. It could just be that the price you pay is that if you don't come at your magic with the good steps good steps okay like for me like the very you know the very first one is intention setting right if you don't come at this with a good in intention and you you before like a pre like i said pre point if you're not pre-planning and have an intention uh thinking about your responsibility thinking about outcomes thinking about consequences uh thinking about is this a wish going through the seven deadly sins like i got steps you know and then if I get down to the nitty gritty, to the, to the 
apex, okay? Is it the apex, the apex or the crux? <laughs> I don't know. The getting down to the crux, right? The crux of all those steps. And then I go to do the magical working. If I don't have all that right, the spell could backfire or the magical working. I won't say spell. The magical working could backfire, right? Is that the price you pay? Is that it just fizzles out like a, you know, like you got this magic, right? And you're doing that blah, and all these steps, you kind of miss one or, you know, you're really not clear on your intention blah, 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 and then it just is down and then you're doing this and then all of a sudden it goes like a spark fizzing out and that's the price that you pay. Must we go back to the basics cosmologically, scientifically, go back down to the basics, like the philosopher, um, what was his name? Em Empedocletus? What was his name? Did I write it down? Empedocletus, yeah. Empedocletus that came up with the the earth being made up of, or the cosmos, the, the whole thing, the whole thing being made up of four elements that are separate and that no one can see the, these four elements because they have to mix to make something. So we'll never be able to see fire in its original form, earth in its original form, air and water, none of them in their original form. They're mixtures of, of you know, they're, they're delicate configurations, right? This is what he philosophized, okay? Which I'm sure I'm a firm believer in. Um, so four elements plus he added to love and strife, okay? The age old thing, baby, of good versus evil, okay? So uh, you could say in that regards, do we have to get back down to basics to even know what magic is, to know how to perceive it, how to tap into it, and then how to use it, how to wield it. Then we can actually become magic wielders. Then once we become a magic wielder, do we have a responsibility to magic to give back, to pay prices? Let me know what y'all think. <laughs> That's a lot, huh? That's where my mind's going today. Let's talk in the comments, okay? Much love.